Welcome back, everybody. In this third module of the course, we're gonna be talking about a broad area of interest called social perception. Now, we're gonna break down a number of specific topics within this area as we progress throughout the module, but what we're gonna be focusing our attention on in the first half of this module is a topic called social communication. To understand the general idea of social communication, I want to first, though, take a step back and just look at social perception as a whole. And to understand this area of social perception, one of my favorite ways to introduce students to this topic is to actually cite a quote that was provided by the authors of one of another textbook that I used to use for this class. It was an author named DeMarco who wrote in kind of the, the topic introduction for this chapter, this really interesting experience that she had. The statement goes as this, after ending an office romance, a female friend of mine threw a bag full of her former paramour's love letters, cards, and poems into an outside dumpster. The following day, he, that's the former boyfriend, called and wanted to know why she would throw out his letters. She was stunned. He explained that a homeless person going through the garbage read the correspondence and called the number found on a piece of stationery. The homeless man was curious as to why two people who seemed so in love could now be apart. I would have called you sooner, he told the former boyfriend, but that was the this was the first quarter I was given today. And DeMarco's quote might not necessarily ring true for all of us right off the bat, but I'm guessing all of us have probably had similar experiences to this homeless man, where there's been something that we've encountered that picked our interest so much that we sort of became obsessed with it. We wanted to be able to make sense of it and understand why what we're seeing it was actually happening. And this is what social perceptual research is all about sort of trying to break down an understanding of what others are doing. And we don't need just that example to appreciate all of the instances where social perception is at play. If any of you have found yourself on the street or at a mall or some other place where you've seen other individuals interacting with others in kind of unusual ways, you probably all found yourself compelled to try to break down what was leading up to what you were seeing. If you saw a shouting match or somebody crying or somebody running, looking scared, you know, all of us have probably had those fleeting moments where we wanna understand all of the elements that led up to that situation and what was gonna happen next. We also all probably have our favorite little reality television show, some of you maybe multiple ones, where you get to peer into the lives of everyday individuals and theoretically get to know more about them by seeing what happens to them behind the scenes. This is again something that many social psychologists do inherently when they try to break down what's causing some of the behaviors that we're observing in people. This is why social perception is so popular in social psychology because people who study it look not only at why we're doing the things we're doing, but how we break down the world around us so we can make better sense of it. As I mentioned before, people studying social perception can actually cast a very wide net in terms of what they're looking at. If we want to whittle this net down into two main categories, what most people often do is they break down social perceptual research into research on how we make sense of what's going on in a situation, so how we infer the personality of the individuals acting in some case that we see, how we make sense of what led to a behavior and what's gonna happen next. That's actually what we're gonna be focusing a lot on in the very next lecture of social perceptual research. But in this lecture, we're gonna focus on the other half that people focus on in this branch of psychology, there, we look not at necessarily just making sense of things, but how the communication process unfolds. How somebody can concoct a message about what they're thinking or feeling or what they want us to pay attention to, and how somebody then is able to break down that message that's being delivered to them. And if we want to understand this process and what we're going to look at a little bit further, 
we do have to understand some basic terms that come along with not only social perception, but another branch of psychology called social ling psycholinguistics. Uh, psycholinguistics and social perception that look at communication talk a lot about this encoding and decoding process that we go through in order to communicate with each other. Encoding being the process of coming up with some way to send a message from one person to another, and decoding being the process of breaking down the message that's sent into something that's coherent and that at least is understood by the receiver. Now, psycholinguistics people and a large number of language researchers focus a lot of their attention on what we call verbal communication, how we can combine words or phrases or even kind of sounds in a way that communicate ideas from one person to another. There's definitely a lot of importance in verbal communication in the social world. If we're going to look at a very social psychology specific area of communication, we usually focus our attentions on nonverbal communication, how we can send across ideas through our actions, either unintentional or intentional, our behavioral patterns or facial gestures, things that aren't necessarily of the verbal nature. And when we look closer at nonverbal communication, what we realize pretty quickly is that there's actually a lot of different ways that we send messages from one person to another that go beyond just language. In fact, when we talk about nonverbal communication, we tend to break it up into what we call nonverbal cue types, the different things that we ask people to pay attention to when trying to convey messages. The classic thing that's been studied by social psychologists for decades has been facial expressions. But I want to point out that even though we're going to spend a little bit more time on facial expressions than other nonverbal cues, there are a lot of nonverbal cues that we use to convey ideas and emotions and kind of other essences of our social world in our actions. Gestures, which is movements of the hands, or shoulders, or face, are things that have been proven to be very effective tools for communication. Body positioning, something that's often overlooked in our day-to-day -day world, has been recently appreciated by many social psychologists as a very important means of establishing things like dominance, superiority, uh, confusion, um, lack of interest. Uh, things that we don't necessarily think of we've established do really matter in our day-to-day -day communication with others. The movement rates that we engage in and how we move can be a pretty big indicator of our feelings, our energy levels, and other things that maybe we do and don't want to communicate in that social world. Touch is another amazing area of interest that has been looked at by a multitude of different psychologists for a variety of different reasons. There's people looking at relationship aspects that, that revolve around touch. There's ones that have looked at power and authority and how important touch is there. There's also studies that have looked at how the brain actually reacts to situations differently when there's touch involved versus no touch. And all of it has given us this kind of rich environment of new information that we can explore that go beyond just how we convey ideas or communicate with each other through just the basic use of our face. Like we've even found that there's certain things that we do with our face that we don't think of often in communication that matter. Like eye contact, how long we look at somebody, whether or not we're willing to look at somebody, can convey a lot of information. And we're, we're just scratching the surface on a lot of these different things. And in fact, there's some things that usually fall into the category of verbal communication that have bled into nonverbal communication research and have become topics of interest and debate as to whether or not they fit into the nonverbal cues category like the others that we've talked about tone of voice, rate of speech, these things have all been kind of tied to this idea of social communication. It's just how we fit them into specific categories is, is a little unclear. But mind you, regardless of which type of thing we're focusing on, people in social communication research that study these things do want to all understand the same thing, 
how ideas are expressed through these different mediums and how impactful they are. One of the main areas that I've mentioned earlier that we do focus a lot of attention on, at least historically, has been the face and how we can get across a lot with our face by just doing a little. If we're looking at the most important area of interest over the years when it comes to the face and communication, we have to go back to the topic that we talked about in our last module, expression of emotions. If you remember back to that class, we talked about this question of which emotions we have that are inherent. And we talked about the work of David Elkind, who came to argue that Darwin's idea of emotions being inherent could probably indicate that we probably should see these things manifested in something like the face. So Elkind and others went from group to group to try to figure out if they could verify this. And we did seem to find pretty good evidence that the face should really have uh, certain characteristics to it when we're experiencing specific emotions. So to kind of verify the veracity of this, I thought we'd do a little activity here. I want you to just guess the emotions that these two women right here are expressing. I'm guessing pretty much everybody instantly when they saw these photographs knew which emotions these two girls were feeling. I'm guessing also when you look at this woman, you can figure out very quickly what she's feeling. Not by how she's positioning herself, not by how she's moving, not by what she's saying, but just by the movement of her face and how it became in that sort of figure. I'm guessing you can also figure out what emotion this girl's feeling. Just looking at her eyes, eyebrows, nose, mouth, all of those things can tell you exactly what emotion she's overcome with at this moment. Same thing here with this gentleman. And also here with this woman. I'm guessing there's no question as to what she's actually feeling in this photograph. And here's the last person that I want you to try to guess the emotion of. Now, I am almost certain that if I tabulated how many you got right, Every single person would have guessed six out of the six emotions that those people were trying to display. And this relates back to what we talked about earlier, is the six basic emotions. In social communication, we tend to call these the six universal nonverbal facial cues. Because what Elk, Ekman, sorry, I think I might have said Elkine, uh, what Ekman, and Darwin, and Susskind, another researcher we'll talk about a little bit later discovered, was that there do seem to be biological mechanisms kind of ingrained within us to express certain emotions in the exact same way. We don't need specific exposures. We don't need cultural norms to be set to express these emotions to others in almost a universal format. And despite there being some subtle differences from person to person. Now what's also interesting to note here is that many people studying the face have gone beyond just the six emotions that we talked about in our last class. Many researchers have now contended that we shouldn't be talking about six universally expressed emotions, but instead we should be talking about eight. Because there do seem to be two other ones that everybody else can pick up on, pride and contempt. The catch is that some of those things that we defined as necessary for basic emotions aren't quite there for these two. We don't see pride and contempt being displayed by one and two year olds. It usually takes till about two and a half, three before kids can really start to display these things clearly. And that's partially because maybe these kids don't have the facial abilities to express these emotions, but it's also probably because there's some critical components to them that aren't there for the other emotions that we've talked about. One of the things you need to be able to feel pride or jealousy slash contempt is this sense of self that doesn't usually form until we're about a year and a half or so of age. We can't really feel jealous that somebody's getting something that we're not when we're expecting that everybody's getting the exact same things in the world. 
we also can't necessarily feel like we got the better end of things when we're assuming everybody gets the same as well. But once we recognize this sense of self and we start to identify social norms of justice and other things, these emotions can start to pop up in us. And when they do, we seem to express them in pretty much the exact same way. And all of this suggests that the face might be a very important window into understanding what it is people are feeling and what they're trying to convey. But when we go beyond those six plus two basic emotions, what we see is that expressing emotions with the face is a little bit more complex than just a basic encoding and decoding process. There's a lot of variability from person to person as to how well we can express emotions and how well we can decode the emotions of others. And it's actually led to this rise in a very important topic in emotion research called emotional intelligence. The ability to kind of tap into what we are feeling, how others are feeling, and, and kind of how to appropriately behave in specific situations. Most people believe at the heart of emotional intelligence is the ability to decode the emotions that others are expressing. We go well beyond six basic emotions in terms of what we can feel. And what emotional intelligence researchers are studying is the emotions and how we can express them and read them in others uh, of the, the kind of fringe emotions that we can have. If you want to test yourself on how well you can read the emotions of others, I provided you this link that you see here. You'll have to enter it in. Uh, note that there's an underscore there. It's a space in that last part. But if you enter that in, you'll be able to actually take a quiz that has you guess the emotions of specific individuals that are expressing faces and try to be able to kind of decode the, the wide range of different emotions that they're listing. It's actually a pretty challenging test, but those of you that do well tend to be people that are higher in emotional intelligence. Those of you that struggle tend to be a little bit lower. doesn't necessarily mean that that's reflective of your overall intelligence or that you can't experience emotions if you're not doing well or you are doing well. It just means that maybe your ability to tap into your own emotions and the emotions of others is a little bit more challenging if you can't perform well on this task, where really you're just guessing the emotions of people based on the faces that they're making. Now this really highlights kind of the importance of our face when it comes to expressing emotion. It is also important to note that there are limitations to this. There's, there's lots of issues where trying to understand what somebody's feeling isn't super easy. Maybe it's because people are making very quick expressions of emotions. Or maybe there's a lot more complexity to the emotions that they're feeling. So what people have tried to do with this information, assuming that the face is very important, is find ways to tap in to, to kind of quantify the emotions that people are feeling through the muscles that they have in their face. This actually relates very closely to the work of a gentleman named Suskind that I don't believe is mentioned in your book anymore, um, but used to be, who, who spent his entire career trying to find the different muscle twitches and nervous system, structural parts of the brain, that actually tied to different emotions. Uh, believe it or not, you do seem to have oftentimes neural pathways linked to different muscles in your face that all get activated when you're experiencing specific emotions. If you look, click on the video link that you see here, you'll actually see some early videos where we were just starting to tap into the integration of computers and understanding emotions and trying to be able to map how the face moved to, to kind of different emotions that people were feeling. But you'll also see in this video that there are some limitations to this. If people start making weird faces when they're expressing some of the, the non-basic emotions, and if they're experiencing mixed emotions, like something called affect blend, then these tools and our tools that we use at our own disposal sometimes aren't efficient. Well, not efficient, I guess effective in being able to, to kind of guess at what somebody's feeling. So if you can, after watching this slide, pause, watch that video. We'll kind of go beyond just what we're covering here in the next slide.
Now, if you've watched that video, hopefully you're more appreciative of kind of the science behind trying to break down the face in terms of how we express emotions. And you might be wondering at this point, you know, are we really unique then when it comes to this? We're the only species out there that has developed these amazing abilities through just small muscle twitches and other things to convey a wide range of different things that we're experiencing. And if we look across multiple species that psychologists and biologists and zoologists and other individuals have studied for years, the answer to this is a resounding no. Human beings are not unique in the ability to express thoughts and emotions through our behavioral patterns that seem to be universal. Now, dogs are the often cited species that to kind of highlight how much can be expressed without being able to speak. You know, dogs, if you aren't familiar with this, are very good at smelling things and creating things that smell in order to communicate things like territory and presence and dominance and other things that well, we don't necessarily notice that often as human beings. They're also, with a lot of their other canine brethren, very capable of expressing things like how happy or relaxed or sad or angry they are simply by the way they posture their back, their tails, their legs, and their head. And in fact, some people have started to try to decode the bark patterns that dogs express in order to be able to see if there's a universal form of communication for most species of dogs. It wouldn't hold your breath for us to be able to ever have a conversation with the dog just by having them bark, but it is kind of an interesting avenue that we've kind of gone down. Other species that we've looked at over the years, even with very simple, sorry, simpler uh, nervous systems, seem to have universal communication processes as well. Stickleback fish and their amazing zigzag dance that have been studied by many psychologists and, and biologists for years have shown how courting can have this very prolonged process involved in it that creates this really weird world that seems to be really specific to this species of fish. That doesn't mean they're the only species of fish that have different things they do to communicate things like anger or interest in creating offspring. Another species that's been looked at that I don't even have listed here are songbirds that create these very intricate songs and dances and other things to try to court another bird or to try to kind of communicate very important ideas to them. In fact, we can go to insects and look at the behavioral patterns of bees and the different dances that they can do to indicate things like danger and the location of specific things like flowers and other elements that are important to these bees. It can, can highlight how, even though humans think of themselves as very unique in terms of communication, we're certainly not alone. There's lots of other species that can do this. So what makes us unique then? Do we really think of ourselves as that magical when it comes to communication? Well, obviously, the thing that makes us very unique in the first place is verbal communication. We can be much more complex with our ways of conveying meaning and processing stuff through that medium. But even in the nonverbal world, we do have some pretty cool things at our disposal that are not universal across most species. One of the things that seems to make humans and other primates very unique is the ability to engage in this process called mirroring, where when somebody or something is conveying an emotional expression through their face or their movements, there's this urge, almost need, to mime or mirror those behaviors back to the person or thing that's expressing those emotions. And for a long period of time, we thought of it just as this quirk, this kind of odd thing that all of us tend to do. In fact, I always love teaching this class in person because I always get to see when we do those faces activities where you're guessing the emotions of others, every single person sitting in the class mimicking the faces that we see when people are expressing anger and fear and sadness. What then brings us to that mirroring? Is it just something that we've learned to do?
Well, there's lots of research that now suggests we actually have structures within our brains that seem to trigger this mirroring activity. In fact, we've given them a name to, to kind of highlight how they are specifically designed to just do that. We call them mirror neurons. And we not only find these mirror neurons and clusters of them within our brains, but we find them in most primate species. They seem to be kind of just this innate thing that encourages, entices primates in particular to be able to communicate with each other better, to understand each other better through facial gestures, by, by kind of triggering this, this incessant need to feel the emotions of others, or express at least the emotions of others. And you might be wondering why this would be so advantageous. Well, understand that we think it's usually advantageous because when we express emotions through our face, it might actually trigger emotions to a small extent when we do it. We sort of discussed this in our emotion lecture in the last module, how there's this feedback loop between us doing things and us feeling things. That kind of goes back to that Schachter-Singer two-factor theory that we discussed in the last module. We, we think that mirror neurons are essentially the precursor to us doing those things that then causes us, to a very small extent, feel those things, even if it's not something we're actually aware of. If we're looking for evidence to support this idea, there's been some really compelling set of studies that have been done on individuals struggling with something called autism spectral disorder, where they don't necessarily have as good of an ability to, to kind of recognize the emotions of others and pick up on the emotions of others that seems to relate to kind of inactivity of this area of the brain that contains these mirror neurons. Now, it's not that this area is completely dead for most individuals who struggle with things related to this spectrum of problems, but there are kind of lessened levels of activity for most people who are diagnosed with this disorder. And the, the extremity of the symptoms tends to correlate in these individuals with how active this area of the brain is when it comes to, to kind of mirroring the behaviors of others. And it really highlights when we look at these kind of isolated case studies and other instances that are similar to it, how we might not necessarily think much of mimicking the behaviors of others, but it might actually be something that gives us a great advantage and separates us out from a lot of other species around us. And this, of course, then brings up the question of, well, do we do this all the time? Are we mimicking not only people's faces, but their body posturing? Are we mimicking their gestures? Or is it just the face? And we have, over the last couple of years, well, decades now, started to poke at this question. If we have these universal expressions of emotions and ideas with the face, are there also ones for our bodies? Do we all make the same gestures? Do we all stand the same way to express different ideas? What we found in numerous studies is a very resounding answer of no, absolutely not. There's numerous studies that have shown that certain things that one culture does to express one idea is, is definitely not something we see in another culture. And in fact, sometimes there can be conflicting messages with things like hand gestures and other things that oftentimes we, within our own cultures, treat as universal. My favorite of the example of this nowadays is the OK term. Well, what used to be the OK term. Historically, in other countries like Japan, that meant money. France, it meant that you were kind of rating somebody as a zero or just kind of using some denouncement of their ability in something. And in Brazil, it was actually the equivalence of giving somebody the middle finger. Uh, in our current culture, in our current society, the OK symbol has suddenly took a new turn in the United States where it's now actually considered uh, a, a hateful uh, gesture. Uh, it's linked up with the white power ideas that, that have been circulating throughout different subsets of the population in the last couple of years. And it again brings us to this realization that something as simple as just putting our hands in a specific spot 
can mean a lot of different things from group to group and culture to culture. There's other symbols that we just think of as universal that mean some very different things. In the US, the L sign, especially when you hit it against the head, means something very universal, where in China it means something very different. In the US, the thumbs up is usually indicating something good, unless you're scuba diving, in which case you want to get up to the surface. And in West Africa, if you do this, or there's other countries as well that have these same issues, you're being very, very offensive when you give somebody a thumbs up. The peace sign is well known by most people in the United States, but in other countries, it's actually seen as an insult, especially if you turn the hands around. If you put it behind somebody's head, the peace sign means something completely different. And in fact, in many Asian cultures, the peace sign sort of means other things, and it's kind of been picked up in a variety of different groups to have different types of meaning. All of this really highlights how once we go beyond the face, we have the same biological predispositions to express emotions and ideas in the exact same way. Instead, what we need in order to communicate with each other when we go beyond the face are some rules that need to be established within our cultures. And this brings us to another really interesting topic that's studied by people who look at social communication, this idea of these things called display rules and emblems. So they might seem like the same thing, but they, they are discrete from each other. Display rules are all about which nonverbal -behavior, non behaviors are, are kind of appropriate and should be focused on. So in essence, what we see is that cultures dictate whether or not eye movement or gestures or how we move our feet or how we move our hands should be focused on or ignored. There's numerous studies that have shown that when people try to communicate across cultures, one of the things that often gets lost in translation is not just the words that people use, but what to focus on. Do you focus on whether or not the person's got their head down or up? Do you focus on their eye contact? Do you focus on how they're sitting? Because even though they might be universal within one culture, it doesn't mean that they're universal across cultures. Another thing that seems to require some attention and when we come to display rules is what's appropriate to display and not. You know, expressing fear, it might be something that's encouraged in one group and, and not necessarily something that's accepted in another group. There might be groups that have learned to kind of go over the top with the emotions that they're expressing, even if they're not feeling them quite to the extreme that they're expressing them, where others are learning in their cultures to be much more subdued with their expressions of emotions, even if they're feeling a wide range of them. Again, all of this falls into the broad category of what we call display rules. It's slightly different from the other thing that we have to learn called emblems, where once we learn what it is is appropriate to express, in terms of do I use my hands, or should I be expressing these emotions, we have to then learn how to express those things. So if you've learned that using your head and moving it in certain ways can express emotions like exhaustion or excitement, well, then you have to learn how to move your head to express exhaustion and excitement and other things. Those are the emblems that we also have to learn within our culture. And what we've seen is that as kids age and as they develop within a group or a culture, they start to develop their understanding of the display rules of those groups and cultures, and they develop the understanding of the emblems. And in doing so, communication becomes much better for members of those groups. Essentially, if you're around a certain group of people a lot, you can convey a lot without using words ever. If you're not, well, then you got to sort of rely on the face, and you got to rely on spoken language, in order to get ideas across, always realizing that there might be some stuff lost in translation along the way. This is a great place, I think, to kind of close up with this idea of social communication. But as I mentioned, it's only about half of this broad area of what we call social perception. In our next class, we're going to be looking at this topic of kind of judging others and making sense of what they're like based on looking at what they're doing. Hopefully I'll see you all very soon when we get to that area, and hopefully you can get a lot.
on the very popular topic of social perception in that next lecture. I'll see you then.